And yes, thank you for being here. Um, and Nadia will be guiding us through a, a little journey here. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about Nadia's background and then pass it over so they can get us started. Uh, so Nadia Cheney is a community arts facilitator and trainer. She is the host of the Time Zone Research Lab and the creator of Toolsy, an on-demand training for community facilitators. Uh, and I can share links to these in the chat. Um, so without further ado, I pass it over to Nadia. Thank you, Dan. Welcome everybody. This is so lovely. Um, I'm really so glad to be part of this conference. Um, maybe we can ask one more time that, uh, that uh, if anyone needs translation uh, and you're not familiar, I think it's the little world symbol at the bottom of your screen. And then you're gonna hear Albert doing uh, translation into Spanish. You'll be on another channel. I'd love to start with um, a little meditation, if you don't mind, just uh, just to kind of ground together, arrive together. To me, sometimes it, with Zoom, it can be a little bit like uh, trying to reach into the screen to find people. And of course, you know, you're not there. <laughs> so, um, you know, feel free to just like relax, lie down, close your eyes. It's only going to be two or three minutes, but just to kind of uh touch base together and then i thought i'd play a song one of one of the songs that we wrote at the time zone and while that song is playing if you could try to just imagine imagine that you could sense where the rest of us are you know um and and kind of like anywhere but in the screen <laughs> anywhere but in the screen uh so let's just start let's start with them um, let's start with See if you can sense the distance between you and the closest drinking water, the closest drinkable water. Feel the distance between you and the drinking water. It might be nearby. It might be a little bit further away. It might be within reach. But just sent, feel that distance and imagine the life cycle of that water. Imagine the millions and millions, 30 million years it takes for that water to cycle through the aquifers. And imagine that water full of creatures, full of sound and vibration, full of traces and minerals, history. Imagine it moving through the trees. Imagine it moving into the sky, raining down. Imagine it moving into your body and out of your body in this cycle of endless generosity of this being on the planet, the water. And then let's uh, let's imagine, actually, let's move to air. Let's imagine the air and see if you can feel the temperature of the air around you and the differences. Can you feel the different temperatures, maybe under your clothing or under your hair, that there are different temperatures of the air? If you can sense it, maybe you can feel it moving or see it moving. If you have a window, see if you can sense it on your eyeballs, how more sensitive your eyes are to the air, or the inside of your mouth, the air that's inside. And then imagine the soil and the, and the gravity. See if you can feel that, the, the mass of the planet, the gravity and that, and that hug that generosity, if you just feel that and feel the layers. See if you can imagine, you know, the history of labor and relationships that is the soil, that history of life and death that creates the soil. And just remember the, maybe the last plant that you ate, the last plant that you ate and how, see if you can feel the soil, how it's inside of you. And then finally, uh, although there are so many other elements, let's think about fire and, and go all the way inside the earth. And there's that core. There's that incredible glowing core that if you're far, 
you can see the earth glow. Imagine our star, our sun, and how, it, how that light is pouring, it's moving through all of us and it's, it's impinging on us, it's giving us momentum, that light. So just thinking about that as a history of, of learning, a history of relationship, a history in that sense, a history of education and of learning to be together. And then I'm gonna play this little song. And with this feeling of these elements and these bodies and that each one of us is like, we're already connected, right? Like we are in a space together. We're in a space together, but it's the planet is big. <laughs> and so I'm gonna play a song and see if you can just extend your consciousness and try to reach the other people, you right? And just imagine that you can. Don't strain yourself, please. This is not the time to waste all your energy. So don't strain and try to figure it out, but just like feel it. Imagine that we could actually sense where, where each other are. I'm gonna play a song that was written. So what, one of the things we did at this research lab that I'm gonna tell you about is um, write songs that would help us remember what we were learning about time. So I'm going to play one of those. And while I do, just you can turn off your vid if you want to. You don't have to. And just sense in the four directions and see if you can feel us. Now, this time I must remember to share the sound. <laughs> this one's about, if you know the artist Hilma F. Clint, this is a song about her work. but you don't need much context more than that. Ready? Now, I'm not going to quiz you on where you think <laughs> we all are, <laughs> but I do. I want to tell you a little bit about the time zone. Um, I I know that there is cat here. Is there anyone else here from the time zone? Research lab. Who's no, who knows about it? I think maybe not. So, cat, it's you and me. Um, I'm prepared, but you jump in if you ever want to in any way, okay? But I've got I've got I got it. <laughs> um, let's have a maybe we could have a little just a tiny 
dash of introduction from everyone who's here. Um, name, maybe where you are or where you're from, whichever is more comfortable for you to share. Some people, where you're from is a very complex question. So it could be where you where you are is perfectly fine or where you, um, you could even be poetic about it. Uh, your name, where you're from, where you are, uh, any specific needs and abilities that you might have that we might be able to support you with. And um, one image of what time felt like for you when you were little. What did time feel like? Now, of course, there's lots of different ways. So just one way that time felt when you were little. Name, if you would like to share a pronoun, if, uh, if that's a supportive thing for you. Any, any needs and abilities? And then this question, how did time feel for you when you were little? I'll, yes, absolutely. People can still keep coming in. It's perfectly fine with me. And you could put the, you could share in the chat just for the sake of time. You could share your answers in the chat and you're fine to share also in Spanish if you like and, or um, any other language if you can translate or if there's a translator for it. Can jump in if you'd like. <laughs> Hello, my name, my name is Tessa, and I go by she and ho. To me, when I was a kid, time just felt very stagnant, but yet it just kept it just kept like a picnic of surprises and happiness. Thank you. Lovely. And where where are you from? Where where are we calling from? From I am from Yangzhou, China. Okay. Wonderful. Welcome. So my name is Lorena. Oh, I see somebody else with my heritage. It looks like um, I am Ecuadorian from my family of origin. Hola, como estas? <laughs> what is more? <laughs> uh, but I currently reside in Colorado, though I don't claim this area. I'm from New Jersey, New York, very different energy. Um, I use she, her, ella pronouns and que más? <laughs> Time. Um, I love this question. I I can remember feeling like time was endless, maybe, and like I would never grow up. Like adulthood couldn't come fast enough to be emancipated. Um, yeah, and now it feels like time has gone by really fast. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you both. There's a few more in the chat here. Victoria, she, her from San Francisco. Time felt abundant, like I had all the time in the world. And Yasmin? Yeah, I'm Yasmin, she, her, I'm from Ecuador. I, my current territory is the Amazon forest. Time was weird. Sometimes we go fast and sometimes slow, and it's still like that. Oh, beautiful, great. I'm curious. Uh, Karina, Nina, Kia, and the Ecuador. I wonder what time it is in Ecuador right now. Is it just like the perfect workshop? <laughs> no needs, child, uh, as living in a constant tsunami. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that, Karina. Here's Kat, she, her, on a farm somewhere outside of Lumbee, Canada. Time was constantly shifting when I was young. It didn't feel like something I had control of. Does it feel like you do now? <laughs> no, okay. A-T. Olmo Eati from Mexico City. Right now I'm in the plant's house transplanting. Oh, I wish I could develop the ability to really communicate with them, with the plants. Uh, uh, when kid, it looks like time does not run away, like it was unlimited. Oh, this is fascinating. I'm so glad I asked this. Uh, Marsha, hi everyone. Yellowhead County and Treaty 6 territory. Time felt expansive, like it would go on forever. Wow, this is fascinating to me. Ishtar, she, her, currently on unceded territory of Pomo, Miwok, and Wapo peoples, today known as Sonoma County, California. Time was extended and unbounded. And Natalie, soy de Ecuador. Vivo, uh, Albert, Albert, will you read it for me so I don't um, massacre the Spanish? 
I can read it if you'd like, or uh, alguien que lo escribió quiere leerlo en inglés. You wanted to translate it? I'm not sure what I'm reading. Yeah, I wanted to translate it. I wanted Natalie. to translate it, which is why he's here, but unfortunately, the I sound. Puedo ayudar. I can help. So, Natalie says, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, I live in the Amazon and uh, in, la comunidad, in a community called Sed. Uh, when I was a child, a little girl, um, there was no time. Um, no había, there was no hurry ni, uh, and no pressures. Everything flowed in the present. Um, we weren't worried about the future and no past existed. Wow, that sounds beautiful. Gracias, oh. Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Ayaka, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Aya, uh, she, her. I'm currently based in Singapore. Keeping the video off as I wake up, absolutely fine. Time as a child felt like a ripe fruit. Ooh. And the soundscape of summer crickets, vast, open at times, a blanket of humidity. I, Albert, yeah, we got to figure it out. <laughs> do, you, do you know, could you translate Lorena's? Yeah, yeah. It would, oh, my. Oh, that uh, is yours. Okay, you share. Yeah. It's just for the Ecuadorians. Like, I'm Perfect, just excited that there's so many here. There's so many. <laughs> if anything else needs to be translated, I think Albert maybe is hooked into the translation, and maybe that's why I don't know. So yeah. I can I can do any other translation. <laughs> Hi, Rihanna. Uh, and then here's Albert. My name is Albert from Southern California, Kumeyaay Territory. Time felt for me full of shades and lights with tons of textures. Yeah, it's funny that there's so many, it's just wonderful. Okay, great. And then, um, is that everybody? Did everyone get a chance to introduce themselves? I feel like we heard, I think we heard from everyone. Great, great. Well, welcome. Um, I'm Nadia. Right now, I am on Algonquin territory, known as Ottawa, Canada. I'm in my parents' basement. Um, and like Dan said, I do lots of community arts facilitation, but this project is my heart's project. This is the thing. I gave myself the opportunity to create, like I asked myself if I can do the thing I most want, the thing I dream of, what would I do? And it was this, it was to study the nature of time. And I then gave myself three years to read about time and let it cook and simmer. And what did I want? Uh, to do. And I thought at first that I would do a series of experiments on people, <laughs> but I quickly realized that, that, that wasn't, that wasn't really the soul of it. And eventually it became the time zone research lab, which is uh, currently at 400 members. And it's um, we've done 108, 107 sessions, no, 109 sessions so far. The first phase was 100 sessions from, from um, November 2019 until October 2021. And we met every single Wednesday, and then we'd spend the entire day. But it was a drop-in. So people could come and go uh, as they wanted to. And that was, in fact, that was part of the, the research itself. So I want to break down a little bit for you what some of the choices that we made at the time zone and how they became our, our methodology, our educational point of view at least, and, and over time became a method. But I also wanna give you a chance to, to play with some of what we made. Uh, we collected this incredible archive over these 100 sessions. And now we're in the next phase and we're, we're all working with the archive. So I'd like to just invite you in for a little tiny taste and we'll, we'll have a chance to make a small art project. You can make it with whatever you have with you. So like a pen, paper, maybe you have some petals or leaves on the ground, uh, some clay, it could be a newspaper page, uh, anything. You'll be able to do it with anything. Um, and when, when it becomes time, I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you a chance to get some materials. We'll probably do that in about, 20 minutes. But first, I want to tell you just a little bit about the time zone. Um, 
so like I say, I, you know, I gifted myself my dream project. And in order to do that, I wanted, you know, I spent a lot of time working in NGOs, um, probably about 20 years. And in that, I don't know if you can relate to this, but there was a, a real exhaustion for me with certain aspects of how these, in, these NGOs were working. What I was mostly doing in the NGOs was training arts facilitators. So training various kinds of group leaders to use the arts in their work. So, you know, it sounds refreshing, but there were, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it was, but there were aspects that weren't. And some of those aspects were like reporting to funders, uh, do, constantly doing outreach, trying to retain participants, um, parachuting in and out of different communities, like not really having long-term relationships. Um, constantly having to adjust what we were doing, not for the community, but for the organizations and the funders, always being in between, it felt like community and organization, just quite draining. There are still some orgs that I'm super happy to work with. So I'm not, I'm not painting all of that with one brush, but there were things that I just couldn't take anymore. So I made some decisions and they turned into a certain pedagogy. The first one was this. I thought back to my, you know, life as a facilitator, and I thought the, the times I enjoyed the most were after school drop-ins. I just always loved that energy. I felt it was the place where people were the most free, where I felt the most free, and where I felt like the relationships I was making was the most authentic. I just loved that place. I loved teenagers after school. And when they would just come and go and play sports and play cards and talk about their lives and, and have food, but that unstructured kind of space. But I also really loved like um, the, the, the teaching assistant part when in my university classes, like when we got to spend time with that young person who was in the field, but not the professor. I really loved that. So I was like, how can I put this, what could this look like? How could I put this together? And so over time, what we ended up doing was creating this thing where I would select a reading about time, like real, really in, um, often very intensely intellectual readings. And across the board, geology, physics, uh, anthropology, archaeology, whatever, we, whatever I could find. And I would select the readings very intuitively. Um, and then I would make an audio recording of the reading so that you know, people weren't forced to, to read and they didn't have to read it in order to come to the time zone. You never, have, you never have to do anything to come to the time zone. You can just come. Um, and a lot of times people come and they sleep. So it's like, it, you, know, you really can do what you want. Um, and then I would make an email and that email and a little podcast at the top of the email would keep everybody in the loop. So you didn't have to come regularly to be able to know what the community was doing. It was like a little newsletter, a long newsletter. And the joke was that you couldn't read it in a week. It was so full of information. And part of what people would do, would, they would scan the internet all week and constantly bombard me all week with uh, things about time. And so we, you know, kind of sort that out and I'd recap the session before and what's going to happen next and that kind of a thing. And then they would come into the session and we would do what I called um, interrupted reading. So you could listen to the audio of the recording if you wanted to hear the whole text. But in the sessions, what we were doing was intentionally interrupting and aerating the text. So hi, there's some folks dropping in. Welcome. You're so welcome. I'm just kind of getting people a little bit of a sense of what the time zone research lab was. It's an arts-based community research lab. Uh, it was all it wasn't all online. The first 18 weeks were live, but then the, the uh, lockdown started. But we were ready because we were already like hybrid. So the pivot was super, super easy. Um, yeah, so interrupted reading had this incredible effect. So what I would say to people is we're going to, we'll read, but any thought that comes to you, sorry, my computer hinges loose. Any thought that comes to you unbidden, you say it and we will make sense of it. So you don't have to know why this idea has come to you. You don't have to defend your idea. You just share the fleeting thought that's coming to you. 
and over the course of time would trust time to tell us what it means. And the up the reason I did that was because I wanted people to just be able to come and touch these very intellectual readings and not feel intimidated. But the upshot of it was way bigger than I ever expected. What happened was we ended up with this, what our, one of our members is Melody and she called it intercosmological space rather than intercultural. What happened was people started to bring their cultural stories, their personal stories, their their spiritual insights, but also their weird, silly, like the nonsense in the mind that actually does make sense if you give it enough space. And if you put enough of these people together, uh, all talking around. So what happened was the uh, reading was almost like a fire and the writer was decentered as the expert, but still with us, you know, and still important in the conversation and still, but the not the guide was somewhere else. It was these unbidden thoughts that were guiding our study. And the upshot of that was that we didn't realize how much we were learning until later. We weren't grasping the knowledge. We weren't, we weren't going to the reading to say, can I grasp this? Can I get it? Do you get it? Do I get it better than you? Who gets it the most? Who's that? It wasn't that. Instead, it was a, this more ambient unfolding where it was like later, and, and, and we'd start to retell the story. And every time someone dropped in, we'd have to recap where we were. And that became the, mem- the, the artifact of memory was from retelling people as they dropped in to welcome them into the space so they would always be on time. They were always on time, right? Perfect timing to recap where we are. And at first it was only me that would do it, but then people really realized I wasn't doing it perfectly. So then they began to also do the recapping and that storytelling, those stories would then weave through other sessions. And so for a hundred sessions, we built this body of very living knowledge that was partly the knowledge in the texts, but partly the knowledge of each other's lives and stories. So rather than sit in a circle and introduce ourselves, kind of like we did just now more formally, the introduction came from this story sharing. And you didn't, you never had to show your face. You never had to um, explain yourself why you were here, where you get nothing like that. It was over the weeks that it became clear who was here with us. So this was the first intervention, this, this meeting of interrupted reading and the drop-in space. And you see what it gave us in terms of, an, of a pedagogy. Um, I just want to mention one or two other little things before I show you. Um, at first I, I thought a lot about like, right, do I write a grant to make this project? Like, what do I do? And like, I didn't want to write a grant. I didn't want to have a funder. I didn't want any of that stuff. So what I ended up doing, my friend Wyant is a master ceramicist and Wyant made an octopus and the octopus sculpture has only one opening. Uh, so if, so things can go in, but they can't come out. And so if you wanted to join the time zone, there were, there were two things that you could do. You either could pay $23 for the 100 weeks, which is about two years. Uh, and that would go into the octopus and stay there. It's upstairs here at my parents' house. And that the idea was that that money would be decoupled from time. Like time is not money. And so that the, that money would just go and sit inside the octopus in this dark kind of womb and act symbolically like a, what I thought was symbolically as a quantum oscillator. Sorry, Albert, I suppose you know that word. <laughs> it was right. Yes, fantastic. It was waving its tentacles. And then, and then what would make the tentacles? Um, the other thing you could do if you didn't want to pay the $23 is you could interview a drummer about the nature of time. And that, that would be your offering. And so we have this incredible collection of interviews about the nature of time. And then as the time zone goes on, if you ever feel you've, got, you've gotten more value than $23 or your, your interview, the labor of your interview, then you pay it forward in your community. And so that's where these tentacles of this octopus are starting to wave and the real abundance of the study that we were doing 
started to manifest was the ways that all these create, and you didn't have to tell anybody what you did, but we knew. And when we get these little whispers and fragrances of what people were doing, we knew that people were paying it forward and this abundance was being created, but it wasn't talked about. It wasn't competitive. You didn't have to, it wasn't like a one-to-one -one thing. It was just, as you gained from this, you gave it away. And it created a space of so much trust. Um, so that's how the finances worked. Uh, and there was like this, I, this idea that at the end of the hundred weeks, I would smash the octopus and I, I couldn't uh, because my mother started a petition to save the octopus. <laughs> So I was foiled again and it was brilliant. And it was, it ended up being this big debate around the 60th session about whether or not we would smash the octopus. And, and this is probably, it's, it's going to sound funny, but it's probably, probably gives you the best sense of what the time zone really is. We had this debate. It was split down the middle. Some people were like, no, the destiny of the octopus. And we we talked a lot about destiny as an aspect of time. The destiny of the octopus is to be smashed. It must be smashed. The other people are like, no, it's a it's a creature. How can we smash it? How? And somebody even said, I wouldn't smash Nadia at the end of the, at the end of the time. So it's like, okay, it's starting to feel like a real octopus, you know. <laughs> now, during that debate, one of our members, Elioa, said, well, why don't we ask the octopus? So I went to get it. It's big and heavy. It's like about this big. And I went to get it and I brought it. And then Elioa said, what does Epoch, it's called Epoch the Usher. And Elioa said, what does, what does it have to say? And it audibly cracked at that exact moment. There's a spiral crack formed on the bottom of the octopus. It didn't, it didn't crack open, but it had this crack. And of course, everybody was sort of, just slightly shaken <laughs> and it was recorded you know and this is the thing we recorded all of these sessions so this gives you a bit of a sense there was lots more we had puppet parties and day-long listening parties and all kinds of things um that were part of the time zone but finally what we ended up with was this extraordinary archive thousands of hours of these recorded conversations of people investigating the nature of time from a hundred different angles and then a year passed. I let it go fallow for a year. And then it was time. I, I got this feeling like I wanted it again. I was really, I, I got quite tired after a hundred weeks. I needed a break. But then when it was time to start it again, I thought, okay, let's play with the archive. But how are we going to play with this archive in a way that allows it to stay alive? And we had one false start that I'll, I'll spare you the, the, the details of. But what we're doing now, we're about three weeks into it. And what we're doing now is we're designing a game. And with each session, we go back into the archive and we, we're doing something called web walking. So we're tiptoeing through the archive rather than trying to drain it or extract from it. We're not like, go, we're not listening to 4,000 hours of recordings of what we already heard. Instead, we dip in, we listen, we, talk, we keep talking, we keep expanding, we keep opening it. And the image is like, if you walk into a forest, how do you walk into a forest? There's so much to gain, but there's a way to be extractive or there's a way to be delicate with it. And so this is how we're trying to be with the archive. And the, the, um, the trace that we're leaving is a map. It's called Kairos and Omen. And this is the name of this game. And it's, it's a it's a game that takes, it takes 12 weeks to build the map. So we haven't played it yet. It takes 12 weeks to build the map. And then on the, on the final, um, the 13th week of the season, we have this big role-playing game where everybody comes and plays a story on the map. Now we have a lot of practice at this because we had a children's time zone as well. They did 80 sessions on Sundays for an hour where they would all tell stories and draw about time. It was a lot of, it was a lot of time travel. It was a lot of portals. It was a lot of in, interplanetary travel and a lot of under ocean travel. But what we really learned was how to all tell stories together at the same time. 
So the adult time zone has some more rules and some like um, ideas and currencies and flows and different things like this. But, um, but we know that it's possible because the children have been ahead of us. They're 80 weeks ahead of us and have shown us how possible it really, this really is. Um, so that, I think that's all I want to tell you in terms of uh, context, or, uh, but I'd love to just to open it up. Kat, if you want to add anything, um, or if anybody has any questions or comments or things that you do that are the same, I'd just love to hear from you if there's anything that you want to share. And then I'll take us into a little web walking and a dip into the archive. You're welcome to use the chat or just unmute yourself. I give you a, I'll give you an awkward moment just in case people are typing. I really have a question. Mm, you mentioned that you did a lot of things before deciding choosing time. Um, I want to know a little bit more about that um, moment, how you choose from all the rainbow of possibilities, this one, and how is that it inspired you to do all of this? There was a moment where I finally realized it had always been time. You know, it, when I when I started to ask myself, what would I give to myself? What's the one thing I want to gift myself? As a child, it was always the curiosity. As a teenager, it was all the poems and songs I was attracted to. I, I could just see the pattern. It had, it had always been knocking on my head. And a week before we started, I heard a voice that said, this is the last thing you'll ever do. Of course, I freaked out. <laughs> of course, I freaked out. But then I realized it didn't mean, it wasn't like morbid. <laughs> You know, it didn't mean something terrible. I think it meant that everything actually was coming towards this already. Um, so actually the three years before, I wasn't searching for the topic. Already, I, I knew it was time. I was reading about time, trying to figure out if it was enough. How, how, how big was it, right? How big was it? Like, Because I'd never even, I didn't realize how many people study time. I didn't, I didn't know what that whole world was. So actually those three years I spent just kind of like starting to uncover what are all these different, um, like I joined two international societies on the study of time. There's more than like, there's many. <laughs> like, I was like, what? This is a thing that people do. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was more, it was more that it was more that I gave myself the time to, to just really read and think extremely broadly. Yeah. Yeah. Something just told me and it was, it had always been telling me. Oh, that's interesting, Albert. Um, this is like, there's this ongoing debate in the time lab about whether time really is a thing <laughs> and whether it can be separated from space. And I think the question of whether it can be separated from weather also is like, a, you know, is, is, is that is the weather an expression of space of the the aspect of space changing you know state change state changes in space it's a great question i'd love to know what you think oh you can't because you're translating <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yeah it's a great question and that's a great point that in Spanish, weather and time share the same word. I really appreciate um, what you've shared with us. I, I hope we get the recording because I had to move around and help Tessa with some things. But um, so I'd like to learn more about this project, but thank you for sharing the, the link to what you've created. Um, I just, as an educator, really appreciated how you shared at the beginning um, not being consumptive with the material the way that we're like and trying to get it right you know and one up each other like I got it um but 
it sounds to me like you're inviting people into this spacious, like mystery of what came up for you, maybe with all of our senses and, you know, there is no right answer. What is, it's like observing a piece of art, you know, um, there it's all our perspective, what we're seeing in that moment, what we're hearing from the story, uh, and then going into, into that, I guess, into creating with, with the story perhaps. Um, so I don't know if you said where these academic uh pieces that you're reading okay so like maybe heady pieces that then are deconstructed in a, in a more creative I'm guessing that's what I'm projecting I'm like ooh, there's so much that can be done with that um when we can drop the getting it right and consuming it in this traditional tacky way that we do <laughs> yeah thank you oh thanks Lorena I love that yeah, I um I did have a rule at the beginning that we wouldn't study any artists. I didn't want to um, take on other people's ideas of time, but then that got kiboshed by the rest of the group very fast. I was like, no, we won't read artists. And they were like, well, why? What? And they pushed back hard enough. So instead, every 12th week, we studied an artist's uh, ideas of time. A lot of the method happened that way. I'd be like, this is the, and then be like, no, it's not going to be like that, <laughs> which was amazing. I loved it. Now I have a hear? question. Yeah, please. I want to, um, I want to be sure if uh, everyone that participated was young or teenager. No, there are various ages there. Uh, the youngest was three in the children's time zone. That went from <laughs> three to 17. And then my eight-year-old nephew would have been the youngest in the adult, what you might mm -hmm. call it. And then the oldest um, would have been somewhere past 75. He was ah, okay. Because I would like just to listen to you, how can you do this with more teenage and young, but with the subject that could be the, the I don't know, like how can we be hopeful of what is emerging in this planet and know <laughs> a hopefulness about the questions that the problems that we're living on right now because i think that maybe in this country we feel more in this time this and i am just thinking of how can we inject a little of hope uh, and and do this like a this cooling thing like mm. you did. Mm, Please, if you want to share. I, I, I think that's a. I think the question says everything. Really, it's a very beautiful question. Um, a poignant question. I think. I think simply the the ability to come and go. And to not to not be forced into an urgency and not be forced into a. Um, into a timeline, into what, you know, this thing where it's like, if you do this, you'll get this, right? Like if you study for the test, you get to pass out. And if you pass out, then you get to go to college. And if you go to college, you might maybe you get ma married. And if you get married, then you have everything and then you get your job and you're whatever, right? Like that, that thing, I think is torture in the face of this extreme unknown. And so I think there's something about creating spaces where people really can, really can come and go and come back and go and be gone for a long time and be remembered and leave traces of themselves and find traces of themselves and find other like cultural elements of their of their own cultures but resonances and through lines from other cultures and this that we that what we know is enough that who we are is already enough i think that lesson is very important because the feeling that the feeling that i have to get to be something in order to participate in life doesn't work with right now um anything could happen so i think we really need to create spaces where the present is sufficient and take that seriously and take it academically right rather than rather than always pushing into the future and i think 
you know, that derivative thinking in terms of, if I put it in terms of economics, always um, uh, betting on the future and, and thereby mining, stripping and predetermining the future is part of the anxiety that a lot of young people feel. But if we pull back here, even in the midst of a disaster, there are often resources to be found. Um, or at least, if not resources, at the very least, there's, there is um, self-sufficiency that can be found. So that, I don't, I mean, your question gives me a chill. It's so profound that I think we could have a many, we get a many hours of conversation about it. But I no, think- but that, That's fine. That's, yeah, with, with that as a seed, it opened my mind and my heart in a lot of ways. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just uh, um, make an offering related to that? I feel like you've you've said it so beautifully, Nadia, so I don't know that I need to add anything, but what's coming to mind is just um, how we've, how, how the colonial world that we live in has mm -hmm. taught us to seek answers external to us and how we reinforce that in education you know, too often that the empty vessel, right? Not not uh, needing to fill these kids with knowledge. Um, but if we knew what we were doing, the planet wouldn't be in the state that it's in, right? So I love the way that you've like, what I'm getting from your experiment, uh, your, your system is like, everybody's a teacher, right? It's everybody has something to offer. There are no empty vessels. So maybe turning it back to the kids, like what do they, what do they think some solutions might be? What gives them hope? You know, how can they be a part of solutions if there are any, you know, um, that sense of agency of um, we don't need to find answers external to us. We have enough. We are enough with, with who we are and with our own communities to find what we need. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, thanks, Lorena. Thank you. Uh, do you want to play a little bit? Yeah, okay, so um, get yourself something. Get yourself something. So uh, if a pen and some paper or a newspaper you can cut into shreds or a, a ball of string, it doesn't really matter. But something you can play with, some, cl some plasticine or clay or I don't know, whatever you like. You could also write poetry. You could do this with, with, uh, with pen and paper and write or get some paints. I think my list is long enough that <laughs> you get where I'm going. Get something you can mess with. While people are gathering their materials, I'll play another one of these time zone songs. It'll be about three minutes long. So you have three minutes to kind of situate yourself. And then I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is, is um, walk you through the archive a little bit and you'll get to tiptoe around and see what you find. Say it so easily, like I can just play a song. Uh, yeah, here it is. This was from the session on death. You read Levina. Time is patient. Death is the patience of. what but you can ask how long being can 
our giving face responds to life by giving way love reciprocates the naked face and death gives no response love reciprocates the naked the body to the leaves and grass. A departure with no excess or consolation and can't be reduced to anticipation. demanded by the duration of time love reciprocates the naked face and death gives no response love reciprocates the naked face and death gives So Lee and I wrote that song in about 20 minutes and, and it directly comes from Levinas's text on um, death and the question, the question in that text is what happens to the face you love after death? And so you can see that it's not just like, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than we already, we already know, like we really were learning a lot. But in the openness and that way that we were approaching the knowledge, uh, we were gain, we were given these incredible boons, like the song would just come. And then we had it and we, and we would sing it and we learned from it and kept learning from it. And it would travel with us. And we'd be like, remember death, death reciprocates the naked face, remember that? And it would come back and come back and come back. And these little axiomatic truths would move through the other texts. Um, so it's, it wasn't that, it, it was very much an educational space. And, and we were learning from the writers. Now that's what I'm hoping is gonna happen for you here today. <laughs> Let's see though, no guarantees. I can't guarantee a thing, but um, we have a little more time. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna give you, um, first of all, the only way this works is if you can allow yourself to make something without needing it to be beautiful. It can't already need to be beautiful. It can't already need to be smart. It has to be allowed to be what it is and the sense will make itself. The organization, the aesthetic, it will make itself. And it may be something you don't recognize as sense, as intelligence or as aesthetic. That's the only, it's the only way I think it'll work. I don't know, maybe, maybe you're like a philosopher and it will work for you to just be super clever. That's okay too. I won't stop you. And I probably wouldn't even recognize it if you did it. But my suggestion is let it kind of let yourself in and play like a child. Um, uh, train of thought. Okay, so what I'd like to do, we're going to build little tiny houses of time. Everybody will get uh, the link to the archive. And you'll choose a session between one and a hundred. I suggest you choose one after 18 because they were hybrid before that. So they're just a lot easier to watch. There's a lot of dead air before 18 in the recordings because sometimes we'd be in the other room. But if I said that to a group last week and the lady said three and she did a great job. So it's just a suggestion. But my suggestion is you choose something after 18. Uh, you'll choose, and then I'm going to give you prompts. 
and and little prompts that will help you tiptoe through the archive. If you find something and you want to follow a different path in that session, you go your way. But I'll keep I'll keep you picking through and probably for about 23 minutes and then we'll come back and share and see what you got. Now my, my request is even if you hate it, will you send us a picture of it? Even if you don't love it, and especially if you do love it, you don't have to put your name on it. You can put your name on it. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we're making these little kind of like a residencies, little suburbs on our map of people who visit the time zone. So your little tiny houses of time, those images would be on the map. Um, but, you know, it's a request. It's just a request. So the link for the, all the Wednesdays is coming to you now in the chat. Do you have any questions before I give you the link? It's going to be a lot of information, okay? It's going to be a lot of information. You just got to swim in it like a dolphin. That's the best advice I've got for you. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's see. Where is it? I did it all on Google Drive, and now we're making um, like a kind of archive with a bit more of a face on it, but it's still under construction. So maybe. When we come back next year, we'll share it with you. So here is the link. Copy link. Choose your number first. Does does everybody have a number? Does anybody not? You got Tess, you ready? Everybody's got their number? 55. Good one. Okay. Ooh, I know what that one is. Okay. I'm trying to learn all 100, but I don't actually know all 100 yet. There it is. So these are, when you click that, you're going to see all of them. Go to yours. Go to the number that you picked and click inside of that. That'll be the, you're going to see the session. They're all a little different. So you might have to be good. I'm so glad you have your numbers. So you go inside and you'll see it. And the first thing you're going to see is that it has a title. So I'd like you to somehow impress on whatever material you're working with. Find a way to impress that title. That could be as simple as writing it down. But it might be if you're working with plasticine, you, you hold it in your mind's eye and you, and you actually make an impression, right? It can be very abstract. But find a way to impress the title of your, of your session onto your material. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Uh, huh. question. Are these supposed to open up? Yes. Okay. I, they it, don't. It's asking, well, I'm assuming the number is the last two numbers. That's right. The first three are a date. Right. So, yeah, I, it's uh, asking me how I want to open it. Open with, like, I need to uh, an app. You need an app to get into Google Drive? Well, no, I'm open in Google Drive, but then I it, the document... Oh, it did open. Never mind. It looks opening. Okay. Oh, I'm going to restart the minute so you have time, Lorena. Oh, sorry. No, don't apologize. This is what funny. are we doing with the title? Just the title. Impress it on your material somehow. So, so whether you write it or draw it or just spit on it, it's fine with me, whatever you do. Great. Now, within your folder, there's a document that's labeled the number and then email. Open that. At the top of it will be a salutation, a greeting. Now find a way to take that greeting and add it to your piece. Can you say that again? Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, you ask. That's great. So inside of your session, there should be the number and an e it's labeled number email. Okay. And then what? And then at the top, there'll be a salutation, a greeting. Take that greeting and add that. It should it should refer to a character, right? It's it's giving you a sense of personage, a character. So somehow add that to your tiny house. And when I say house, I mean it very loosely, right? A crab shell is a house. A wink is a house. A house that we're creating. You're creating a house, but it, it's not a literal house. It's the right. place where this will live. 
on our sheet or whatever. On your, on your sheet or whatever you're using. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to only get more vague as we go with my instructions. It's, oh, it's the octopus. Yeah. Shh. Okay. Is it? There's an octopus for everybody. Everyone's will have an octopus. Now, my instructions are going to get loose, more loose as I go. But right now, go to the bottom of the email. Not the very bottom. At the very bottom, there's like a bunch of instructions. But just before that, just before the closing, it says Dr. Times Archive. Bye, Karina. It was lovely to meet you, too. See Dr. Times Archive and see if you can bring the essence. What is the essence of that quote? See if you can bring it into your tiny house. Don't think, just feel. See if you can make the impression of that quote on your image. And it's fine. What I would do is start to layer these, but you may do it differently. Because you might be using something that doesn't layer. You have to trust yourself. Something is coming here. We're looking for a certain kind of sense making that actually comes after, not before. Allow it to make sense rather than make it make sense. This is where it gets a little iffy, a little different. So you're going to go back into the folder, leave the email, go back into the folder. And in there, you're going to see the audio recording of the reading. You'll know it because it has the number, the author's name, and then a title. It won't say, it will not say podcast. It'll, it's an audio recording of the, and, it, and don't go into the folder that says recordings. Those are the recordings of the sessions. You can go in there later, but you're looking for the recording of the text. And what I want you to do is drop into that thing, mute yourself, drop into that audio somewhere in the middle. And see, listen until it makes sense. Listen until you get some sense, some meaning. And when you get that meaning, pluck it and add it to your piece. Actually, I think I'm going to leave you alone for 10 minutes. So for the next 10 minutes, just pick your way through. Pick your way through the recordings, the podcast. Uh, go into the recordings folder. You'll hear the sessions. Just pick around and see if you can gather a little, some little flowers from the forest. See what you can add to your piece. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Okay. So here's your final thing. Just one minute. Somehow give it a frame. So that could be anything. A frame could mean you cut it out. A frame could mean you draw a circle around it. A frame could mean you give it a name. Find some way to house it. Okay, brilliant. Great work. I know it's perfect. Whatever you have made is exactly what it needs to be. You may not know what it is. That's okay. Let's see if we can figure it out together. So I wonder, does anybody want to share either your experience or your piece or both? Uh, anybody want to share with us a little bit? We've got about um, 19 minutes here. And so that, you know, a few minutes each uh, would be great. Tessa's going to share. Yeah, Hi. please. Hi. I am Tessa, and we got Lesson 77, which was which is intuition. Side so camera's kind of blowy, and let's just try to zoom in, see if we can get the camera to clear up. Oh, I wow. I, oh, wow, I can see it. Do you think? Yeah. So let me just zoom on in. Whoop. Yes. So oh, wow. They both run. I cannot hug you back. Lose your face and love unconditionally. <gasps> and that's a slot machine who cannot hug back. Oh my God. Rest. And yeah. here's the rest. Here is the valley of intuition. It may be very rocky and very bumpy, but as you keep walking, you will get a strong gut feeling of the right path that life will lead you on. Mm. Oh my God, it's incredible. And yeah. there's a hand trying to make sense of everything, but is unable to because of this, because of this how fluid, fluid intuition is. Mm. That is mine. 
Oh, thank you. Gorgeous. She's an artist. Yeah. <laughs> 77. That was a good one. Stop wow. <laughs> <laughs> lose your face lose your face and and hug me back lose your face and love unconditionally lose your face and love unconditionally <laughs> amazing tessa thank you and thanks for breaking the ice for us too you're very yeah. welcome okay i'm just gonna show my doodle mm -hmm. Ooh. oh great oh you both did intuition amazing so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just had fun drawing and then I started making little characters, but then I stopped myself and I have some words in there in Spanish and yeah, um, a brain of some kind. And uh, down here I put mucha caca, muchas, <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause I got into the, the document, the article and I was like, ugh. It, did, mm. it wasn't inspiring. I mean, I mm. just picked into different spots of it, but mathematics and heady. And I was like, I'm mm. not interested in this at all. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's beautiful. What Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much. The, my emails in the chat, if you can, if you would send photographs, it would be wonderful to have them be part of the map. Thank you both. Anybody else want to share? Uh, you, you can share what your experience was like. That was great, Lorena. Thank you. And and also your images and drawings. Yeah, Dan, please. Uh, let me spotlight myself. So this is what came from number 22. Um, and I kind of started over here. This is the title of number 22, which was Hauntology. Oh, yeah. And then we moved in this direction. And then we moved over here and down to Unghostingville. This is our unghosting community here. And then we got over here and came up here and down here. And then things started to get a little bit crazy. And then we found out who was behind all of this. And it was this character here that showed up unexpectedly through clicking through the Google Drive documents. And what do you mean it showed up unexpected? Did, did something happen? No, I just kept clicking things and like going to a random page or just like seeing a random piece. And there was a character like this in one of the drawings. And brilliant. And then where they showed up on the page, it, it seemed like they were behind all of this madness. They were the ones that were making this happen. It's a very sad reading. Mm. That reading on hauntology and I think yes, feel it in peace. Yeah. That's me. Beautiful. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. I can show mine. Please. Mine was 33. Well, uh, 77, 22, and 33. <laughs> Just... Yeah, a lot of magical numbers. <laughs> Um, uh, mine was listening. The story was uh, really random and make me draw this um, spiral because it says like it felt like the time was uh, something like this. I don't know. I don't remember the word. I just remember the feeling. Okay. And I um, put one phrase from... Uh, I guess it was a book. It was a book that uh, was there in the archive. And I, um, at the beginning, I was like, I don't want to read all of this. But then I remember it's time. You can just use these seconds that you have. So I just crumbled over the pages and I took this phrase, which is saying, I had cheerfully accepted it as an unavoidable risk, one of the risks that a man has to take. And I love that phrase. So, yeah. Great. Fantastic catch. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Oh my God, this is so fun. This <laughs> is so fun. That is so great. And it's amazing because what it brings all these things back to me in this in this wave. There you really is a part of it. 
it's amazing what you're catching. Uh, Dear Heart, were you about to share? Yeah. Okay, so a lot, I have like a really crappy phone and internet. <laughs> so actually a lot of it didn't open for me. Oh, rats. So I just went with intuition as well. Ooh. Nice. And I was painting. <laughs> um, and so I did see that the title was light. I think it was 20, but um, anyway, <gasps> this is what like came. And then um, there was definitely like um, in the middle, it's like, there's like a little hole which like now I'm seeing <laughs> like the light through mm. and Amazing. yeah. And the octopus is there. Oh my gosh. It's incredible. Wow. You, and you, you really took it from the title. You're muted. Yeah, the stuff wouldn't open and I just. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad you kept going. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Albert, for sending it. Yeah, thanks for sending it through the. Please send, the, send me pictures to the time zone research lab at gmail.com. Uh, anybody else want to share what you, what you got, what you caught? These are fantastic. I can share if you want. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I was making this like, I don't know if you able to see, but I made like this Ooh. labyrinthine twist and turns. And then one of the kids that I'm with started helping me and then added these like toy trucks to the labyrinth. Yes. Which I really like. I like went away to like do something else and came back and he'd just been like, hmm. Wow, really? <laughs> like, otherwise I was like, do you want to help? And he was mostly kind of doing like a, like a confetti edition with the rose petals, but then was just like, they're like very specifically placed trucks. Ah, rose petals just keep coming and coming and coming, don't they? That's amazing. Those are not yeah. the same rose petals as yesterday's session. They honestly might be, because when I got on the bus, Shakira gave me Shakira gave me a bag of rose petals. Of rose petals. Okay, cool, cool. What so they might be the you, same one. Were you working with a certain session? Um, sixty-four fucking paths. Well, ah, labyrinth. That's labyrinth. the forest. Yeah, that's yeah, that's brilliant. Oh, good, good. That's a nice, really nice link too, because it we have to think about where these houses will go. I want to show you all the map. Does anybody else want to share? First, uh, Ishtar, did you want to share? Sure. Oh, <laughs> ritual. <laughs> ah, the salamander. Yeah. I actually cheated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because How I cheated cheat? 88, and as I was looking for 88, I was like, ritual i gotta go to ritual Yay. you know how oh, it is it's like, yes. and i didn't even see what 88 was which i find really interesting i'll have to look later um but i don't i'm i, I do a lot of odd kind of exercises with my students and I, I loved what you said about you know don't expect something and particularly around not producing something beautiful and I just felt, I felt like they feel sometimes when I ask them to do things, you know. But what's so fascinating is this, actually, because literally, Eliade, Eliade, I mean, I just got sucked in and I couldn't come out of it until these two, um, until I heard these two things, which was immersed in dream time and saturated with the sacred. And that's when the salamander or the... You know the the lizard, the dream, the dream, the dream being came, and like he kind of sucked sucked me out of the vortex that I was <laughs> totally lost in. <laughs> it was great. It's an incredible yeah. reading. It's such a beautiful reading. Yeah, wow, I you. love that piece. I could get sucked into that spiral. Right. So deep. Thank you, Nadia. Great, great practice. 
I'm so glad. Um, everybody is welcome to join. Anybody's welcome to join us uh, if you'd like to. And there's, you know, no minimum commitment, right? Like literally, like, and you can obviously unsubscribe at any time. Um, but let it, let me show you. The map is just starting, so we're on. It's unless there's anyone else. I just want to check one last time if there's anyone else who wants to share. I don't, want, I don't want to skip anyone, but you don't have to share now. Oh, sorry about that. You don't have to share now um, to send your pieces into the map. That That's perfectly fine. Oh, you had 53, but then got pulled into 55. Interesting. See, it's really interesting because these, I played Chronophoria from Chronophoria in the beginning, and the double digits are mostly Chronophorias, which are novels written as playlists by Jarrett Martineau, who hosts a show on CBC, if anybody knows, um, Reclaimed. But uh, he would make these day-long playlists for us that were actually all, each one was an investigation of an aspect of time. And so many of you picked those, which I think is really, really quite fascinating. Um, let me just show you the map. And the question actually that I would love to close with, if you want to think about it, is what do you feel how to, as educators, you know, about this, this type of learning, this non-grasping kind of, it's a more ambient kind of learning. And I'd love to know how it's landing on you from the point of view of education, rather than the point of view of time studies. This is the map. It's just, just starting. So you can see, so this is the, the first session that we did. Um, and you can zoom way, way. So this is like a map of the ocean floor over here. And then this is the battlefield of the brain. They all reference um, the study. And then when you click here, you see, you, you hear um, clips from the shared readings. You hear uh, clips from the internet here. Over here is the forest of infinite pathways. It, I think my computer's working a little too hard right now, but they're actually in focus. You can go all the way in. Here's John Trudell at the House of Lost and Found and Mingling Languages. So soon, this map will be populated with 13 sessions, and then we'll play a role-playing game. This is Cat's Bubbles over here. Uh, and we'll play a role-playing game where people come and travel through this map in their imagination. This is a very dangerous place. It's a hair salon called Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, but it's a place where you could be lobotomized. Very, lose your memory. And over here, you could get it back if you cross the river. So this is what we're working on. Now I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is that you're, there's going to be, we have, you're the second people to make tiny houses of time. And I think I'm going to make a little, like a suburb almost, of those who visit the uh, time. And so all the sessions, but they'll link to the big session. So your houses will be together, but they'll be linked to the session that you studied. Uh, so that's kind of what, that's all I have to share. But I, yeah, like I said, I'd, I'd love to hear if anyone wants to reflect uh, what you think about this type of education. And not so much in a good, bad, but I mean, if you, if that's what you have, but, but any reflections that are landing on you. Um. So uh, as I was uh, playing with the being that came to me, um, it just like asked to be unfolded, like folded and unfolded. Um, and so like, that's what's so interesting. It's like emerging, you know, it's like emergent. And so I was like playing with it and it was like doing all these like, crazy wild things to like show the light like Whoa. to bring to the center point yeah like you can fold the time and unfold it through like light points Uh, you're totally blowing my mind and I know you're blowing Kat's mind right now too. We don't have time to explain why, but it's just so resonant what you just did. It's incredible. 
do you think, dear heart, there's any chance you might take a video of that? Yeah. Folding in, that would be really, really precious. Thank you. Whoa. Yeah, emerging, unfolding. Like, uh, that's, yeah, thank you for those words. That's, that's very helpful. It's very helpful. I'm kind of blown away. <laughs> yes. uh, wow. Oh, in Ecoversities, you have the Unresearch Lab. Ah. Okay, okay, cool. Right. But it's also like emergent research in the sense. Nice. Oh, I'd like to learn more about it. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, it, I, I held it um, every Thursday, um, every by a separation of two weeks. Um, and what I have found is that each session is really different because um, different people join so, and different conversations emerge. And I come there completely not prepared. Everything is improvisational. Therefore, um, it helps it helps with the nature of these conversations in the sense that they they are always fresh and the connection is something that it's really nice. Um, the original name of that lab was the Coversities on Research and Wayfinding Lab. And the intention is to learn from the more than human world. At first, I didn't embrace that idea, but with time, it became obvious that when when we start to dance intentionally with these more than human dimensions, um, things start to sprout. Um, it is similar to the drawing of this session, mm. which is Neil Tyson. Um, running away from the outer space of darkness inhabited inhabit by the octopuses. Um, it, like a good scientist, he always has a, a laser gun on his pockets or something to me measure um, the world. And light is his, is his, is his house. Um, He's in opposition to darkness and light, um, I feel. And I don't have a great op opinion of Neil Tyson, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> he's oh. like Richard Dawkins, so um, mm. he's not a scientist of wonder. Mm. And each of us is a scientist. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. And thanks for all your work too in in the translation. I wish I could have heard it at the same time. Actually, it's, it's <laughs> such a powerful art form in and of itself. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, Dan. Thanks for hosting. Great to meet you at long last. And thanks everybody for coming. It really meant a lot to meet you. Please join us if you'd like to, or, or if you know anyone who wants to, you're more than welcome. You can just, um, Go to my, I can put the link in here, although I think you got it above, but you can just go to my website, which is just my name, and you'll see the time zone and the link is there to sign up. And then you'll just get these long, 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 super long emails. You needn't read them to come, uh, but the Zoom link is in there and it's always the same Zoom link. So you can just, uh, you would, you know, you're more than welcome. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you all so much. Thanks a lot, Nadia. Really Yay. wonderful to meet you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you so thank much. You so much, Nadia.
Such a pleasure. Thank you.